1 Samuel chapter 16, and while you turn there, let me pray one more time. Father, hear our prayers, hear our cry for mercy. Do not pass us by. Fill us full of the Holy Spirit to listen well, to learn well, to remember, to apply. Lord, to be soft-hearted before you, that you can shape us, mold us, and make us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, protect us from the evil one. Bind him from this place. Don't let him snatch the word away from our minds. But Lord, let it be planted deeply into our hearts that it may bear much fruit for your glory. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and ask yourself this question. I want you to think about maybe the hardest thing you've ever been through in life, or maybe the hardest thing you're going through right now, or maybe the most confusing time you ever went through, or maybe the most confusing situation that you're in right now, where there's a decision you have to make or something you have to do, and you really don't know what's best. Or maybe a time when you know exactly what you're supposed to do, what the Lord wants you to do, but it seems almost impossible to do it. You don't want to do it. It seems too hard. Don't want to follow through. Okay? Why was it so hard? Why was that situation so confusing? We're going to look at three different men today who faced such situations and see how they responded. 1 Samuel 16, we're basically at the halfway point of the book. We're looking at, in this chapter, the three main characters of the book. Samuel the prophet, Saul the outgoing king, David the new incoming king. And we're going to see how these three different leaders in God's Old Testament church responded to hard situations. And we'll start with Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 16, look in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Now, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, Saul had sinned again. And Samuel had said, God has rejected you from being king. But Saul was desperate to cover up. He didn't want anybody else to know. Samuel, will you please at least go back to the worship service with me so all the elders will see that you're with me and they'll think I'm in good standing. Samuel finally did what he wanted. So as far as we know, nobody knew that Saul had been rejected except for Samuel and Saul. The rest of the nation thinks Saul's still the king. He's still acting like the king. But Samuel knows he's not God's king anymore. God's not with him. God's not blessing him. God's not using him. And Samuel's heart is broken. Samuel at this point was an old man. He'd lived a long time. And when God had first said, we're going to have a monarchy, I want you to appoint Saul the king, he wasn't excited about it, but he got on board. He did it. And in the beginning, Saul was a great leader. And there was probably a great sense in which Samuel thought, you know what, the greatest achievement of my life was appointing Samuel to be the first king, and he starts out great. And then... There was even a time where Samuel, in a sense, was going to retire, take a step back. And then King Saul started to fall apart. And there's a lot of grief. And listen, there's a good and right time to grieve in life when things go wrong. But there's also a time to dry your eyes and get back up and get back to work. And that's basically what God comes and says to Samuel. Enough grief. Enough sadness. Yes, Saul's been a disaster, but it's not the end of the world. My plan will still be accomplished. Get up. I've got another man for you to anoint. Verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So God tells Samuel specifically exactly what to do. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, God, I wish I was still living in Old Testament times where I could get like the whole audible voice thing so it would be really clear? Hey, if you ever had that experience, please tell me. I'd like to hear about it because I've never had one. Doesn't seem to be the main way God's working these days. But here's what I want us to see. Even sometimes when you get that in the Old Testament, Samuel's like, I hear loud and clear what you're saying, but it doesn't sound like a good plan to me. Sounds like it leads to death for me. Anybody else up there I can talk to? And God says, no, no, I'll tell you what to do. Take an animal and say you're coming to make sacrifice. Listen, Saul at this point was was a traitor. He was a rebel. This was just war ethic. Imagine if you were a spy behind enemy lines. You wouldn't feel compelled to tell the enemy everything you were doing and thinking. And God says to Samuel, you don't have to tell him everything. He gives him the wisdom that he needs. Listen to Matthew Henry. This was a very great quote to me. Those that go about God's work and God's way shall be directed step by step. Wherever they are at a loss, 
to do it in the best manner. Basically, if you're serious and sincere about obeying God, God will give you enough wisdom to be faithful in that moment. James 1.5 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, if any man likes wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So when you're in a situation and you don't know what to do and you really want to obey the Lord, if you'll pray and ask for wisdom, God will give it to you. Now, will he speak audibly to you? Almost certainly not. But what he will do is he will guide the natural thinking processes of your brain. You may not have a vision or feel any electricity shooting through your body. But God will give you enough wisdom to be obedient in the moment. Look at verse 3. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? They see Samuel the prophet coming to town, and they're terrified. So probably the word had started to get out. Samuel and Saul are not on good terms. And if Samuel's coming to our city, that may go bad for us with King Saul. Verse 5, and he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Okay. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And just think about this. Do you remember when Saul was first anointed to be king, what it was said about him? Head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He looked like a king. Even Samuel, the great prophet, could fall into the same error. As long as they look good, they look tall, they look like that's what matters. And God's like, that's not what matters to me. We can get too caught up in outward appearances. And in some sense, the real theme of this whole chapter is verse 7. God cares much more about what's in the heart than the outward appearance. Human beings tend to care much more about outward appearances. But I want us to think about it this way. What do you care most about? And I'm not talking about when you're evaluating somebody else. I'm talking about when you're evaluating yourself. Do you care most about what other people see and think about you externally? Or do you care more about what God sees and thinks about your inward heart disposition? We know the right answer, but it's much easier said than done, is it not? Okay. Now, he starts to fall into this error, but God corrects him. And let's skip down out of verse 10. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And we really only see Samuel one more time in the book of Samuel before his death. But Samuel finished well. It was hard. He was old. Things were not looking good. But God said, I got one more task for you. Go anoint the new king. He was a little scared, a little confused, but he did it anyway. And some of you may be a little bit more advanced in life. And I know one thing that I'm starting to learn. I guess I'm middle-aged at this point. The older you get, it's kind of like there's more bad news coming. When you're younger, there's a lot of optimism. And some of that optimism is naive. And the later you get in life, you start to see more of my friends are getting divorced. More loved ones are dying or getting sick and not getting better. More things in your body start hurting. And you go to the doctor and they say, tough, nothing we can do. More bad news coming. But if you're older, if you're advanced in life, you need to be like Samuel. Lord, you still got me here. What you want me to do? How can I live on purpose for you? Even if it's scary, even if it's confusing, if you'll make your will clear, I want to finish well. And Samuel is a great example of finishing well all the way to the end. And why? Because ultimately he said, I don't care most about what Saul thinks about me. I care most about what you think about me, God. And I'm going to live for your approval, not for the approval of other human beings. 
That's why he finished well. Now let's look at King Saul. Verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now again, in the Old Testament, sometimes the Holy Spirit would come on a person to help them lead for a certain period of time, and yet they weren't necessarily converted, and the Holy Spirit could leave. You see this with some of the judges, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago. You even see it with Balaam's donkey. The Holy Spirit is taken away. Now in one sense, guys, this is terrifying. God sends a demon to terrorize Saul. Martin Luther said, even Satan is God's Satan. He's on a leash. God controls all things, even the demons. In one sense, that's terrifying. Why would God do this? But in another sense, it's comforting, is it not? Because whatever demon might be out there stalking you, he's on a leash that God controls. Now listen again to Matthew Henry. Very important. Those that drive the good spirit away from themselves do, of course, become prey to the evil spirit. If God and his grace do not rule us, sin and Satan will have possession of us. The devil, by the divine permission, troubled and terrified Saul by means of the corrupt humors of his body and passions of his mind. He grew fretful, irritable, discontented, nervous, and suspicious. You understand what Matthew Henry is saying here? This is a great old Puritan commentator. This is not some extreme, crazy charismatic. He's saying when you willfully reject, stiff arm, grieve, resist the Holy Spirit in his ways, it's like you are inviting the demonic into your life. And a lot of times when the demonic is trying to have an influence on you, the result will be you're fretful, you're irritable, you're discontented, you're nervous, you're suspicious. Anybody identify with any of those things? We have a day where we feel that way and we're just like, oh, maybe I didn't get a good night's sleep last night. Maybe. Maybe something more is going on. Okay? Now, Saul's main connection to God had been through Samuel. So when he lost his connection to the prophet, he lost his connection to God. And guys, when you don't have a sense of God's approval in your heart, you will be groping around looking for approval anywhere in life and it will always fail you. And so, therefore, you will be miserable. You will be fretful. You will be suspicious. You will be irritable. You will be nervous. It's a cursed way to live, literally. Let's keep going. Verse 15. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed. Parted from him. Now, this is a good plan. Let's find somebody that can pray some worship music <laughs> that will block the mental passages of your brain, so to speak, so Satan won't have access to you. And Saul says, okay, let's do it. But here's what I want you to see as I kind of meditated and rested on this passage. The point is, this was a short-term fix. Do you notice? This, the demon kept coming back. Worship music gets played, the demon ran away. Martin Luther said, you want to get rid of the devil? Start singing praise to God. But the demon kept coming back. He wasn't really healed. And what a lot of us do when we're struggling, when we're suffering, is we want short-term, bare minimum, band-aid answers. Because we don't want to go all the way to the depths of our heart and have to really repent. As I was meditating on this passage, I was like, well, what should have Saul done? He should have repented. He should have gone back to Samuel the prophet. He should have sought him out and said, what must I do to be right with Yahweh? I'll do anything. And it's highly likely Samuel would have said, resign as king. Step down. I told you God rejected you. But why didn't Saul do it? You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to figure it out. If you're the king of the nation, 
Who wants to resign as being king? All this power, all this approval, all this prestige, all this reputation. Who wants to lay that down? It's addicting. And so he hung on to it. And he came up with a short-term solution to kind of get by, but it really didn't help anything. So ask yourself this, is there anywhere in your life where God is calling you to a deeper level of humility, a deeper level of repentance, to quit playing around with short-term, bare minimum, band-aid solutions and go all the way to the heart of the issue and cut sin off at the root level rather than just kind of dealing with the fruits and the symptoms? And now let's look at young David. Notice in verse 11, Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. This would have been a -a once-in-a-lifetime event for Samuel, the great prophet, to come to your house, to your city, to have a feast, to have a sacrifice. His family must have not thought much of David. It's like, hey, let's get everybody. Except for David, leave him with sheep. Who cares about David? He didn't seem to have a great reputation with his family. Youngest kid left out there doing the dirtiest chores. But here's the thing. When they invite him to the party, there's no evidence he complained. You guys left me out again. None of that. He comes in. He seems humble. He seems content to take the lowest job. And then look at verse 18. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Now, we don't know how much later this was, but it seems like some time has passed since he was first anointed to be king because David has started to gain a reputation. He's growing. But look at verse 19. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. Now, guys, Just put yourself in this passage with me for just a second. If you're the youngest son in a family, seven older brothers, and nobody's treated you very well, do the dirtiest chores. And when we have a party, you don't even get invited. And then the prophet comes to town and anoints you and says, you're going to be the next king of God's people. How do you think that would affect your attitude at home? I know how I would respond. I'd say, hey, guys, I'm never touching a sheep again. I'm sitting up in the big house all day long. One of you is going to be fanning me with a palm leaf. Somebody else is going to be feeding me grapes. right? Somebody else come massage my feet. I don't know, but I'm not working in the fields anymore. I'm the coming king. And if you want to have like a position in my kingdom one day, you better serve me, not David. So humble. I'm anointed to be king, but it's not time for me to be king yet, so I guess I'll just go back to being a shepherd. Humility. Lowliness. Contentment. And then he gets called up to play the liar for King Saul. And he would have figured out really quickly, Saul's gone crazy. Saul's got a demon. I'm supposed to be the next king. I'm actually a godly guy. I spend my free time writing worship songs. This guy's a nutcase. But what did he do? He said, if God has called me to serve the nutcase, demon-possessed king for now, I'll do it. He's content. He's humble. He's not grabbing after more positions and power. Are you content in your station in life that God has assigned you? Are you humble to do whatever job God might be calling you to do? One commentator I was reading said this, Only faith makes us willing to be the lesser. you got to be saying, I care about what God thinks about my heart more than what people think about me on the outside. And then you say, I'll play any role, high or low, that God wants me to. You can humble yourself. Okay. Is there a place in life right now where God is calling you to be more humble, to lower yourself, to be more content? Now, just a couple of thoughts by way of application. When you are in a hard situation, when you're in a confusing situation, when you're in a situation where you don't know what to do, it seems impossible, or you do know what to do, you just don't want to do it because it seems scary, how do you respond? Do you respond like Samuel? Do you pray for wisdom, get the wisdom, and then go forward? Or are you more like Saul? You know what you should do, but you don't want to do it because it will cost you too much. You're hanging on to the pride, the prestige, the position, the power, the reputation. Do you care more about what people think about you, or do you ultimately care more about what your Father in heaven sees in your heart and cares about? 
Can you be like David? Can you be content and humble no matter what? No, let me just make a really practical point here. There is nothing wrong with wanting other people to like you. There's everything right with wanting other people to respect you. Your boss, your spouse, your friends, whoever, co-workers. But you can't be controlled by that. And let me try to give you an illustration I, th- I think will be helpful. Most of y'all know I went to Thailand a couple of weeks ago, and, and the longest flight on that whole journey was a 16-hour flight, and I don't sleep good on planes. And so what I try to do when I've got a long flight like that coming up is I try to, and really the whole travel time is about 30 hours. What I try to do is I try to get a really great night's sleep before I get on the plane, maybe nine hours if I'm lucky, but it usually doesn't work out that way. And you know what? I might doze off for five or 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes while I'm on the plane, and that little nap helps. But you know what? I'm not depending on the nap. I'm depending on the nine hours I got before I ever got on the plane. You understand what I'm saying there? And then the nap helps, but I might not even get the nap. The nine-hour rest in your life ought to be the smile and approval of Father God. I love you. I like you. I chose you. My son died for you. That ought to be the nine-hour sleep in your life that just gives you comfort. And then listen, if your boss or your wife... Or your kids, if they like you, that's like the five to ten minute nap. It helps, but it's not necessary. And if you flip it the other way, and if God's smile on your heart is like a five to ten minute nap, and people's approval is the nine hour long sleep, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be a roller coaster ride. Because you might have times in life where everybody's smiling and cheering. Just like when the Lord Jesus Christ walked in to the city of Jerusalem and people did lay down the palm branches and cry out, Hosanna, son of David, Savior, the King. But almost certainly some of those very same people were in the crowd a week later crying out, crucify him. You may have high highs, you'll have low lows as well. You've got to live ultimately for the smile and approval of your father only. One last passage, Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to turn there, if you don't, I bet you know it. Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When the true and greater son of David came to earth, he wasn't beautiful. He didn't look like a king. And most Jews in that day, what they were really looking for was another military leader like the original David. They were sick. What they thought their main problem was, was the Roman oppressors. And we need a military king to ride in here on a war horse and throw off the Roman oppressors. And Jesus comes, this humble, meek, gentle man. Didn't look like what they wanted. But see, they were after short-term Band-Aid solutions because you can throw off the Roman oppressors and still die in your sin and go to hell. And what Jesus knew then and now is your greatest problem is always your own sin. It's not the circumstances out there. My greatest problem is always my sin. Your greatest problem is always your sin. And Jesus came to deal with that. Jesus was sitting in heaven with all the power, all the privilege, all the prestige, all the honor, all the laud, all the glory. He didn't grasp onto it. Although he had a right to, he could have if he wanted to. He willingly chose to lay it down, step out of heaven, become a humble man, become a poor man, become a broken man, become a crucified man. And how was he able to persevere in life? He had the smile of his father. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And here's what's so ultimately beautiful and powerful. On the cross, Christ lost the smile of the Father. He wasn't experiencing 
that smile, that warmth, that blessing. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He lost that experience in our place so that we can be assured that we have it if we're in Christ. The Father smiles on me. He smiles on his people because of the righteousness of Christ. And that we're free. And that we ought to be bold to say, I don't care what people think about me. The Father loves me. The Father likes me. The Father's chosen me. Let me go and live for his glory. Pray with me. Father, I plead with you that you would be transforming us from one degree of glory to the next. Please don't let these truths be old, numb, boring to us. Let there be a fresh sense of shock and awe and wonder that you are such a good and gracious king. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life, for his death, for his resurrection. I pray more and more that the truths that we know in our minds would sink down into the basement of our heart. They would burn and they would shine and they would change us. That we would feel approved in Christ by our Father in heaven. And that would lead us to much boldness, much obedience, much humility, much contentment. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.